Beneath the unforgiving expanse of the Antarctic ice was buried a relic of the Cold War's clandestine scientific pursuits. What pursuits? That I didn't know. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to find out. I had been working as a private contractor after my serving. And then I got a call from one of my previous contractors about a one-time government job. I was hesitant at first, considering it was all the way out in the Antarctic and that it was some kind of old Soviet facility. But the figures on the contract were enough for me to put aside my unease, and so I signed it along with at least five NDAs. My job was simple and easy. Protect a team of intrepid scientists who were heading into the depths of this subterranean enigma. Our journey began in the port city of Murmansk, Russia, where a sturdy icebreaker, the Rosalka, awaited us. The crew, a seasoned bunch of polar veterans, greeted us with stoic knots and weathered hands, their eyes reflecting the harshness of the environment they called home. As the Rosalka sliced through the icy expanse, the Antarctic horizon unfolded before us, a pristine wilderness of frozen silence. The facility, codenamed Project Polestar, was located in a remote, uncharted region of the Antarctic continent. As we approached the site, an eerie silence hung in the air broken only by the howling wind and the crunching of our snowshoes. I could sense that the scientists were queasy, but nobody spoke a word. When we reached the facility, I was a bit surprised. It wasn't like I expected anything to be obvious, but there was nothing I could spot. The team had started to open one of the many heavy bags they had brought, take out their personal protective equipment. One scientist handed me infrared glasses, what? I asked, bewildered. Put this on, otherwise you can't find the way in. The scientist replied without even looking at me. I read the label on his coat. Martin. Way in? I thought I was just supposed to be your security detail. Martin didn't look too pleased. Do you see anything outside here in the snow that might hurt us? We don't know what's down there. You're coming with us. I sighed and fought against the urge to roll my eyes. What an arrogant prick. I wore the glasses and looked around in snow, as if a blind man trying to feel his way in the wild. That's when I spotted it. The entrance. It was concealed beneath a thick layer of snow, only visible through sophisticated infrared scanners. The facility itself was a marvel of Soviet engineering, a massive underground complex buried deep into the bedrock. As we entered the facility, the air was thick with the smell of stale metal and damp earth. The walls were lined with an array of scientific instruments and intricate machinery, all bearing the faded insignia of the Soviet hammer and sickle. If this is still our base, then why do we want to assume it might be dangerous? Arena, another young scientist, asked. It might have been infiltrated at some point, or maybe someone else found it before us. You can't expect a secret base to stay secret forever, do you? I try to reason. I highly doubt that, Martin mumbled. I didn't question him. The last thing I needed was to run into some stupid argument with the head of the team I was protecting. We were walking down a long curved flight of metal stairs. It was dark, but our flashlights were helping illuminate the way. When we were at the bottom of the stairs after maybe more than five minutes, Martin spotted a circuit breaker and immediately flipped it up, bringing the entire facility in front of us to life. I felt the ground vibrate as the lights flickered on, and we heard strange sounds from the distance as if we had started a couple of different engines. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. There were a few control panels, a number of cabinets and stacked boxes with dust collected on top. Strangely enough, there was no smell, of any sort, at least none that I could identify. The scientists started to set up their equipment and turn on their computers. I spotted a metal door at the far end of the room we were standing in. Marks caught me looking at it. That is where the good stuff is supposed to be. I didn't like his smirk. It made me feel ignorant and a little freaked out. What good could possibly be behind a metal door that a team of scientists had come down for in absolute secrecy along with security? It's a different thing reading history textbooks about what we are capable of and seeing it in person. How did you find this facility anyway? I asked. We read about it, that the Soviets had started to trail a hole to harness the Earth's geothermal energy 
drilling deeper and deeper until their drill pierced into a hidden chamber. Martin replied, nonchalantly. So the Soviets didn't make it? The Soviets made it into what it is today. Martin wasn't the man to share the details. We pulled open the metal door. It took the brute strength of five men, but it worked. At the heart of the room lay a vast, cavernous chamber, its center dominated by a colossal hole plunging into the depths of the earth. The hole was encircled by a network of catwalks and observation platforms. Dr. Mikhail, an astrophysicist known for his stoicism, kept glancing nervously at the walls. I wasn't sure what to make of it. Maybe the poor guy was cold or afraid of depths. Martin motioned for the team to gather around the gaping hole, the frigid air swirling with an unseen tension. Into the abyss we go. One by one, the team descended into the unknown, flashlights cutting through the icy darkness. The walls of the narrow tunnel seemed to close in, bearing the weights of decades of secrecy. The temperature plummeted, and the air grew heavy with an otherworldly presence. Whispers, soft but insistent, echoed through the tunnel. A chorus of voices, long silenced. The tunnel opened into a cavernous expanse, the ceiling lost in the inky blackness above. Ice formations clung to the walls, refracting the feeble light into a fractured mosaic. We moved cautiously, the crunch of snow beneath our boots magnifying the unsettling quiet. In the cavern center lay an ancient console, adorned with buttons and levers frozen in time. Martin approached his gloved hands tracing the contours with a mix of trepidation and curiosity. The console hummed to life, casting an eerie glow that revealed the cavern's secrets. Projected images danced across the ice-encrusted walls, a visual record of the facility's dark experiments. Chambers aligned with ethereal blue light, starting beeping green and red. I walked over to one of them to try to look what was inside the chamber through the glass. It was hazy, fog covering most of the mirror, but I had started to make out details. A protruded nose, a sealed mouth, as if sewn together by an amateur nurse or maybe in a hurry, swollen eyelids with blue veins popping out. What the f- I couldn't make sense of it. I walked over to another chamber, disregarding what everyone else was doing. I peered inside and I saw dried blood over the glass. Beyond that, I could make out a frail figure, but it was clearly not human. It was almost a hawk, but it wasn't a bird. Birds didn't have legs, did they? Uh, I mean, they do, but like human legs. My trail of thoughts was broken by Marx's whistle. Jackpot! What a time to be in science when there were no ethic committees and scientific misconduct. This is truly amazing. Marx points over to smaller chambers. I walked over to see that there were eggs inside, but they weren't regular eggs. Far from it. The chambers were all cryogenic experiments on hybrids. There was an old notebook hanging from one of the cryo chambers. It was illegible, but there was no doubt about the drawings and figures inside the notebook. It's a log of their work, I stammered flipping through the pages looking at the beasts that looked half human and half animal or a bird and, at instances, neither. Don't touch that. You'll ruin it. Martin sneered at me. Jeez. Here, you can keep it. I tossed it over to Martin, his hands flying in the air to catch the lock as delicately as he could. He's insane. I noticed another lockbook. This one was bigger and looked even worse than the one I had thrown at Martin. Avoiding any glances, I swiftly put it in my backpack and adjusted my shoulders. That was when I heard a thud and turned around to figure out where it came from. None of the scientists seemed to have noticed the sound. It wasn't that loud, but it was not quiet either. It was as if someone had opened or closed the latch, left the room. I counted the hits in the room. There were three missing. Martin? Who's not here? I asked him quietly. I don't know. Why should I care? Martin didn't even bother looking at me. I gripped him by his shoulders and turned him around so he would look at me. I am responsible for your team, remember? Where the fuck did three of your people go? I tried to keep my voice low, 
But by that point, the others had already noticed that something was wrong. I don't know. Martin looked around inside. Ari, Volkov, and Alexei are not here. Did anyone see Ari, Volkov, or Alexei leaving? I asked the whole group. Nobody responded. Fuck. A sudden chill prickled my skin, and my senses heightened in response to an unspoken warning. I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that settled deep within me, an inexplicable discomfort gnawing at my insides. None of the cryogenic chambers had opened. At least, that was a good sign. Look for doors, openings, hatches, anything. They couldn't have gone back up. Everyone started to look for literally anything, hitting the flashlight against the hard walls, feeling them for a secret button, a brick to pull out or push. After a couple of minutes, I heard the same thought I had before. I turned around, and this time, we found the source. One of the other scientists who had found it was now looking at me, expecting praise or something. These people really needed to get their priorities straight. Aside, I ordered the guy and walked over to the small opening. It seemed like a vent, but big enough for a person to comfortably crouch on their knees and crawl. Don't tell me. We're going inside. Everyone, follow me. I interjected. We crawled through the dimly lit vent, the sound of our collective breaths and the distant hum of machinery echoing in the confined space. The twists and turns of the passage heightened the tension, each subtle movement reinforcing the covert nature of our mission. The cool air clung to us as we progressed, the anticipation and nervousness building with every inch. Finally, we reached the end, emerging into a dimly illuminated room that seemed frozen in time. The ambient glow exposed an array of control consoles, their screens flickering with complex data. The low hum of machinery provided an unsettling backdrop to the scene. As our eyes adjusted to the light, the true magnitude of our discovery unfolded. In the center of the room stood an array of ominous devices, their purpose unclear from the design, but it sent a collective shiver down our spines. The group walked over closer to the devices held on stands. At first glance, the enigmatic instruments resembled sleek futuristic headsets, their design suggesting a purpose beyond our immediate understanding. They were comprised of a combination of smooth curves and angular components, devoid of any visible buttons or controls. Their metallic surface glinted under the subdued glow of the room's lighting, hinting at a level of sophistication that went beyond ordinary technology. The absence of familiar features only intensified the mystery surrounding their functionality. We exchanged glances, but said nothing. Our curiosity tinged with a growing sense of caution. The devices were crafted to be worn over the head, much like a headset, but their form deviated from any conventional understanding of such equipment. No earpieces or adjustable bands were visible, leaving us to wonder how they secured onto the wearer. As my team and I continued our examination, an unsettling realization settled in. An acknowledgement that these were not ordinary headsets. The absence of wires and traditional components only deepened the mystery, leaving us on the precipice of discovery. That is, when I noticed, there were some empty stands, three to be exact. Shit. It was impossible, right? For the three of the missing scientists to be related to exactly the three missing headset things. As if on cue, a distant sound echoed through the cavern. A rhythmic thud that resonated with an unsettling familiarity. I closed my eyes and crouched, signaling everyone else to follow. Footsteps. I whispered, my breath forming a frosty mist. Everyone fell silent the rhythmic thud growing louder, reverberating in the air. From the shadows emerged figures, silhouettes clad in tattered lab coats, their faces obscured by the icy gloom. The strange device we had found was on each of their heads, but it glowed red. I took out my Heckler & Co. from the holster, posed at the approaching figures. The team, their breath visible in the frigid air, formed a defensive formation the other soldiers with me were pointing their guns, following my suit. The figures were now close enough for me to notice that their eyes were devoid of any life. How could that be? Alexei? Ari? Volkov? I spoke out their names in hope that they would somehow recognize their own names and respond. But I knew I was just wasting my breath. Something deep inside me knew 
This was not normal. This was not human. This was wrong. No responses came from the figures. Easy now. I called out, the words hanging in the stagnant air. The scientists remained motionless. It was as if they were in a trance. But that was cut short when they turned with mechanical precision that the atmosphere shifted from uncertainty to immediate danger. Panic surged through the team. I hesitated for a moment, grappling with the realization that these were not the scientists we were meant to protect. They were different now. Inhuman. Without warning, the three figures, their movements eerily synchronized, lunged towards us with a startling burst of unnatural speed. Time seemed to slow as I reacted on pure instinct, my trained reflexes taking over. The sharp report of gunfire echoed through the chamber as I squeezed the trigger, each round punctuating the air with deadly intent. The muzzle flashes illuminated the grim determination etched on my face as the shots found their marks. Yet, to my disbelief, the figure barely flinched. It was as if the bullets had collided with an invisible force field, leaving the mad scientists unscathed. The echoes of gunfire faded into a disconcerting silence as the figures, undeterred and seemingly impervious, rose from the ground with an eerie puppet-like grace. A chill ran down my spine, and a glance at my team revealed mirrored expressions of disbelief and growing panic. The unsettling reality sank in. We were facing something beyond our understanding, a force that defied the laws of nature. The figures, once human, now moved with an unsettling resilience that bordered on the supernatural. Alexei, what the fuck? Martin screamed, but it didn't make a difference. It was as if they couldn't even hear anything we were saying, almost as if something else was controlling them. Get out of here, now! I yelled at the top of my lungs. I heard feet scuffle behind me, but I didn't turn around. Not yet. I continued to shoot as did the others with guns in frail attempts to slow down the figures coming at us. The figures, momentarily halted by the barrage, faltered before resuming the relentless pursuit. Panic surged through the team as we retreated, the reality of our helplessness sinking in. The abandoned facility, once a silent witness to forgotten experiments, now echoed with the disconcerting sounds of our struggle against the inexplicable forces that controlled the scientists. Fall back! Move! I shouted, the urgency in my voice echoing through the lifeless corridors. We retraced our steps, the once familiar paths now transformed into a maze of terror. The pursuit of the figures intensified, their relentless advance mirroring the haunting echoes that surrounded us. The facility became a battleground of desperation. We sprinted to the decaying chambers, the dilapidated remnants of forgotten experiments serving as obstacles in our desperate pit for escape. Every turn revealed the figures, their mechanical movements devoid of emotion or reason. Marx slowed down and fell behind the group. He hurriedly scanned his surroundings and looked for the logbook we had found near the cryopods. I turned around and saw his hands trembling as he sifted through, trying to pull the logbook away from the chamber and at the same time trying to open the chamber. Are you out of your mind? We need to get out! I yelled. The figures, their movements unnaturally swift, materialized in the corner of the same room. Marx, run! Ivan, another scientist on the team rushed, taking place in front of Marx, as if creating a momentary diversion, before both of them were running again. But they were quite behind. We couldn't shoot at the creatures anymore, because we would risk either of them taking the bullet instead. But the figures were unyielding. Their pursuit took a sinister turn as they swiftly overpowered Ivan. His valiant attempt to aid Marx abruptly ending in a futile struggle. The air resonated with the sounds of a struggle, muffled grunts, the clatter of equipment, and the haunting echoes of inhuman movements. Marx was next. I knew it. And I hated that I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't turn back to help him. It was far too late. Martin, get everyone out, now! Martin was leading everyone out while I covered him. The air charged with tension when I saw Marx fallen on the floor, just gaping at the figure hovering over him. The figure's movements were unnatural, a puppet manipulated by unseen strings. Marx tried to turn and escape, but the other two figures slammed him on the cold floor, their presence overwhelming Marx. I would have died right then and there from the shock. 
A guttural sound echoed through the corridor as one of the figures lunged at him with inhuman speed. We heard loud gasps and screams of agony echoed behind us. Damn the lockbooks. Damn this facility. Damn us. The last thing I remember seeing before we climbed out of the facility was watching Marx's lifeless body crumpled on the floor in a pool of his own blood. His eyes, once filled with arrogance, were now reflecting the stark horror of an inescapable fate. The rest of the team, unaware of the gruesome spectacle, emerged into the night, leaving behind the remains of Marx's violent demise. Breathless and shaken, we emerged from the facility, the cold night air hitting us like a wave of liberation. The door sealed shut behind us, cutting off the haunting echoes of the struggles within. We stood there in the moonlit darkness, exchanging glances doing all the talking. We waited in tense silence, straining our ears for any sign of pursuit from the figures within. But the facility remained eerily silent, as if it had swallowed the horrors we left behind. The only sounds were our own ragged breaths and the distant howling of the wind, carrying with it a foreboding sense of the unknown. Eventually, we reached a silent consensus. We had to leave. And I was never coming back. Ever. No number on a check would change that. Slowly, cautiously, we started to move away from the abandoned facility, in the darkness swallowing us as we retreated into the night. Days passed, then weeks, and the memories of that harrowing night lingered on my mind. It wasn't until two months later that I remembered about the old lockbook I had put in my backpack. My heart raced as I held it in my hands, contemplating if I should try to see what it was. Maybe it was all garbage, but there was a chance I could figure out what they were planning. I retreated into the shadows, seeking solace in the dim glow of my computer screen. The lockbook lay before me, its pages filled with the erratic scrawl of the scientists who dared to play with forces beyond our understanding. The handwriting was a chaotic dance, an intricate cipher I was determined to unravel. There was no way I could ask anyone else about this. The government would be on to me. I couldn't go to Reddit and casually ask about what the writing could be. That would be even worse than the government. Nevertheless, I wasn't going to stop. I treaded lightly leaving no trace of my pursuit in the virtual underworld as I explored the dark web, used AI and books that were probably no longer found in any libraries in the world. As the digital curtain veiled my movements, the lockbook slowly revealed its dark secrets. The scientists had not only tampered with the threats of the mind, but had also woven a tapestry of horrors in the form of cryogenic chambers. Half-hybrids, twisted abominations with killing instincts beyond the scope of reason were stored in those chambers. They were an unholy fusion, waiting for the perfect moment to be unleashed upon an unsuspecting world. One of the reasons they hadn't used the hybrids yet was that they were trying to perfect their mind control devices. So that's what the headsets were. I read the deciphered text on my screen. They 2,553. The team thinks we're ready to use the Aurora. I don't believe that. What we have is just a skeleton of what it could be. I know we can make it better, so that the wearer is a blank slate and we fill in the strokes of beautiful red and let the impure blood wash away the sins of the past. Their vision is short-sighted as always. They need to look at the bigger picture. They need to create a bigger picture. I will continue my work. I will make our mother proud. I exhaled deeply. The tension still stayed inside me. The mind control device and the hybrids were just instruments. Pawns for a far more sinister purpose. I shuddered at the implications of their grand design, a malevolent symphony orchestrated in the shadows. The lockbook. My silent accomplice had become a Pandora's box, and I stood at the precipice, torn between revealing the truth and keeping the shadows at bay. Sometimes at night, I would feel like those creatures were in my room. Other times, I would have dreams where I would be inside one of those cryogenic chambers, banging my hands against the metal, screaming to be let out, 
but people behind masks inject the chamber with green gas as that made me choke, and I would wake up gasping for air. No word came from my contractor. No explanation or directive. It was as if the mission had never happened. But one thing I know for a fact is that the government certainly wouldn't stop here. They would send in another mission. When? I don't know. But the real question is, what the hell do they plan to do with the hybrids? Mind control devices. And Lord knows what else they will find down there. When they go in, more prepared. And then the last time, 